I, I really like the focus that we had yesterday where we talked a little bit about coaching, because I think a lot of people, I know you're, you're not trying to sell anything, but I think so many people undervalue the importance of getting coaching and because getting traction in life and in your practice is so challenging to do anything is really any, any little things, you know, the big thing is opening another office or getting associates or things like that. But even the small things, you need that accountability. So I think that would be a good focus for, for the listeners. Okay. Yeah. Hello, and welcome to Podiatry Practice Mastery. My name is Don Pelto, and I have Matthew Dearman here with me. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you, Don. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more today. Uh, we chatted a little bit yesterday. We had internet uh, issues, but you know, you're in a kind of unique position where you are, you have been coached and you are coaching people currently. And I think a lot of us as, as podiatrists, we're business people, we're busy working 40, 50 hours in our practice. And we, we have a lot of a time getting traction. And so how does, and go back a little bit before, like how you started to get coached and how it's helped you and maybe, you know, some big, big aha moments that you had by using someone else to help you be accountable. Yeah, the the idea of coaching is not new, right? I mean, it's something like you don't you don't join a little league team and just go out and play, right? There's always somebody there who is going to teach you the basics of of how to hit the ball, how to field the ball, um, how to what the rules are, right? In general, and and we kind of lose sight of that as we get into adulthood. We think, oh, we 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 know how to play. So, and especially in medicine, mm-hmm. we get out. Of residency with an amazing skill set uh, for for fixing people, but really have no clue about the rules of the game that we're about to play, right? Mm-hmm. So if, if you consider your practice a game, uh, which it is, because if you you hung your shingle, you're, you're basically saying, okay, I'm in the game, and you have to write your, your rule book. But if you don't know what you're doing, then it becomes more difficult. So you know, for me, I, I started in a practice that had a, a pretty poor contract. I needed to, to differentiate myself and build the business uh, because I had mouths to feed at home. And it was kind of do or die kind of situation. Fortunately, in that situation, I didn't have a lot of patience to see when I was just starting up. Mm-hmm. So I was able to figure out all the, you know, the marketing aspects and how to build it and, you know, build a website way back when, when few practices had one um, and I was doing it all uh, myself. And so I had time to kind of figure it out, but you realize there's organizations out there as well. So the first one I joined was the uh, American Academy of Podiatric Practice Management, which, me too. Know, yeah, I, I think that's probably where we met many, many moons ago. Um, and, uh, you know, they give you kind of the, the basics of, of stuff, but it doesn't necessarily put it all together as far as what's really necessary to succeed, right? Because, you know, the, the people kind of leading it aren't necessarily, you know, going in the direction you want to go to. They're going in the direction they want to go to. And everybody has their own direction because, again, it's your own game. Yep. You know, um, It was nice to be podiatry specific, but we needed to kind of step out a little bit, you know, and then there was another organization, Top Practices, which was great. Um, Learned a lot about, you know, more marketing kind of stuff and, you know, how to look at different things in the practice, but nothing again, overly in how to really enhance the business the way I wanted to. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I discovered uh, the Scheduling Institute with Jay Geyer and, you know, he taught me how to answer the phones and, the, the value of, of training of the staff and how to look at myself as the, the CEO and business owner that uh, I was. And then I discovered Fabi. And that's where everything kind of clicked because I was able to put everything back into what I had learned, the education, you know, how, how we, we learn in, in residency and in school, see one, do one, teach one, right? So you can see I was fortunate in residency to see very successful practices um, as opposed to other residencies where you stay in the hospital the whole time. I was out in the field looking at private practices and spending a lot of time there. So I saw it and then I started doing it. Um, And when you do it, you know, you're, you're in the thick of it. And as you said, you're seeing, you're spending 40, 60 hours a week, but are you spending it doing the things you enjoy or are you on the hamster wheel of the 40 to 60 hours letting the practice run you instead of you running the practice. Um, so 
it wasn't really, I mean, I was, I was successful by, by most measures. Um, but when you start teaching it and you start coaching it yourself and you understand the rules of the, the basic rules of the game, you know, with this, with the premise that we all have our own game, we all have our own end game, mm -hmm. whatever that is, whatever the age of retirement is, or the age of selling the business is, because there's only two things a business can do. A business can close or a business can sell. That's it. Mm -hmm. so when we put those parameters on, we calculate what we need financially to end the game. Um, and then we can have fun and then we can play, right? Like you're doing. And I love it. That's, yeah. that's, I, I'm, I'm so uh, inspired by your, your level of play um, in that it's not necessarily about the money, right? Money will come if you do the right thing. Yeah. It's, it's the rule of the money, right? So you give back. And it comes. Um, you don't, you know, you don't wait for it to come. You don't like, like, okay, I did it. Now where is it? It's mm -hmm. you do it, and eventually it's just like, oh wow, I got this. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I guess I deserve that. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so, so it's been a process as far as as the coaching world, and even now, I mean, think about it. These Olympic athletes, right? We're about to watch the Olympics. Do you think one of them does not have a coach? <laughs> that holds them accountable multiple for the things that they need multiple. They've got coaches for nutrition. They've got coaches for, for their physical exercise. They've got coaches for their specific sport. They've got, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. And yet we as podiatrists and, and, and clinicians think we undervalue it. We say, Oh, you know, I, I know how to do a bunion. So therefore I don't need to be coached. Well, how are you going to get paid for that bunion? Yeah. You know, and are you going to get top dollar for the, yeah. the work that you did? You know, Matt, what now the challenge for people is they look at where you're right now. You recently just kind of you have multiple doctors working for you, sole owner, sold your practice. But what they don't see is like all the struggles to get where you're at. And I think one of the struggles for younger people starting out is they see someone 20 years in and they get what we call in the coach called the gap. You kind of look at how, well, you know, Matt so far ahead, you know, you're ahead of me. I, I'm, I'm a little bit ahead of the other people listening. And what people don't understand is that change is slow and it takes time. I don't know if that's your impression, but I always think I'm going to be so, I think the big changes happen quick, but the small changes take a lot longer uh, than, than people think. So tell me about your experience coaching people. Is that something that you find or do everyone, you do everything you tell them and it, they get it done in a year? Yeah, well, we we discuss the gap in the gain a lot, right? And it, it's part of one of my values is is being excited about my future, but reflective of my past. So what I mean for for the people listening that don't know, this was a Dan Sullivan strategic coach idea, and I think it's his probably his next big book that's coming out too, which is really cool. Um, the gap is that area that the horizon that never changes, right? I have a gap. You have a gap. Even though we can be successful in practice, there's always a gap because the horizon keeps moving. You're never going to reach it, but you got to spend time in the gain. The gain is where you are right now to where you were five years ago, 10 years yep. ago, and you have to appreciate where you've been. So anybody who's young in practice can look back and say, wow, I made it through med school. I made it through residency. And that will put, you know, the frame of reference back to where you can be excited about where you're going. But the key to knowing, to, uh, to looking forward is knowing where you're going, right? As long as you have that destination, the journey is a whole lot more fun. If you don't have a destination, the journey is going to run you and you don't know where you're going to end up. Mm -hmm. So some of my most exciting uh, relationships that I have are with my associates, my young first out of residency associates, because they get to see, okay, you put in the work, you do it. You know, I'm in practice now 18 years. Um, and, uh, you know, first few years kind of built something. And then I started my own practice in, in 2006 with one doc and then two docs. And now we're up to six with three offices. And it just, it's a gradual they call it a slow burn, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a gradual kind of win that you go. But I always knew the vision that I had to have like the largest independent foot and ankle business in Hampton Roads, the, the southeast area of Virginia that I practice in, um, and to be able to do it my way, right? That was that was key. So my younger associates getting out, they don't look at me and say, "Oh, I, I, I," you know, they they look at me and say, "Yes, I can do that," because he's showing me the way. Mm -hmm. 
So if I can find a young practice that's just starting out, you know, and say, okay, here's the, the basic roadmap of what you really need to focus on. And we start with what's your vision? What does your game look like? Where is your end game? And if they can't articulate that, you know, they are going to, they're going to be lost for some time. You don't know where you're going. Cause for some people, it might be a single practice. Some might not want multiple practice because exactly. the headache. I remember um, Dan, Ke Dan Kennedy, he's the marketing guy. He didn't want to have any employees and he's done great without having any employees because he hated them. Yeah. And I was like, wow, you know, so your end game might be one practice, but it's a, a multi-million dollar practice, recurrent revenue on something else could be you know, other products, it could be developing a, a, a brace, it could be, there's a lot of other end games that you could have. Oh, absolutely. And revenue is just one number, right? And it's not even the most important number. The most important number is your profitability. Mm -hmm. So within, within Fabi, uh, I work with practices that have, you know, mid revenue, like 500,000, 600,000. I work with others that have, you know, well over a couple million. Mm -hmm. And the profitability might actually be the same but there's a lot more headaches. So that's what I, I say is, okay, yeah, I've got three offices, six docs, but I also have more headaches for other things. Fortunately, I enjoy a lot of those headaches or had enjoyed it, um, you know, up until the, the, the recent uh, merger and acquisition. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's one of those things where you just have to look at the, 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 the profitability, the margin and how efficient you are in practice, not working your staff too hard, but working them to the point where they're working to their potential, you're working to your potential and you're getting what you deserve. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think I just want to focus on, now let, let's talk about, can you go through some examples of some practices, the, the slow kind of consistent progress that you've helped them through and what are some of the barriers to them making this progress? Uh, I think it's it stems to defining who they are, defining their vision again, uh, defining their mission. You know, do, do they have a purpose in the practice? You know, what is that overall purpose? There are practices that practice by accident, which is most people getting out of residency and starting and even people who've been out for a while and they're, they're quote unquote successful because they've got money in the bank, but they're practicing by accident. Then you've got those who practice by intention. So those are the ones that I look at that are being coached. Those who are deliberately trying to improve their practice uh, through standard practices of others, you know, and, and learning different techniques and stuff. So we've taken practices from that are just starting out uh, at, you know, four or five, 600,000, taking them to that million dollar mark. Mm -hmm. We've taken them to uh, doing new associates. You know, we just started a program uh, and I'm, I'm real excited about this because I wanted to do it for a while. Um, we are taking people who just got their new, their first associate right? Or maybe they've had an associate in the past and it didn't work out. And they just hired a new one that's going to start in, in July or August. And uh, we signed them up for coaching for their associate. Wonderful. Right? So these people, most of, most of the people that have signed up, the owners of the practice understand the value of coaching, right? So you got, got past that hurdle. Mm -hmm. So now they, they understand the value for themselves. They want to put it in their associate. And I firmly believe that we're going to get you know, a return on their investment that is, is a lot, like 10, 20 times their investment at least uh, in their associate, because we're teaching the associate practice etiquette. We're teaching the associate the importance of vision and knowing their own vision. We're teaching them billing and coding and the basics of it. How many people come out and have no idea what to do? So many. So many. Um, understand their role within the business as far as being a physician, as being an employee, as being a mentor, as being a colleague. I mean, they have like seven, eight different roles that they have to play that they're just thinking, I'm going to be a doctor. And there's yeah. so much more to it, right? So those now, are the things that we transform. No, Matt, what's the best way in your opinion? I think I, I know the answer, but you know, there's some ways of doing this where you record all these videos and you have people watch them. There's other that are small group discussions. Others are one-on-one -on -one discussions. What do you find wor works best for people? Is it the one-on-one? -on -one? Is it the group? Is it just watching recorded videos? I know I can't watch recorded videos. I just, I get bored. I have kids to take care of, you know, other things going on. If I'm not present, I don't do it. So how about you? What do you find works best for your clients? Uh, it's different strokes for different folks. Right. And that's what we're really finding is some people can do well with kind of that video learning and that's fine. So the, the new um, the new course we're offering with Fabi Academy is kind of like it's like what first year mastermind was. And I'll talk about mastermind in a minute. 
but what it is is it's basically 12 calls one call a month and we spend an hour to 90 minutes presenting on very specific topics that build the foundation of the business and you know we try to make assignments but there's really you know there what you put in with what you get out um so there's not much one-on-one -on -one attention there's mm -hmm. question and answer sessions that come and it's and it's going to be really transformational for those practices that either can't afford a mastermind so the academy the initial offer was ten thousand. now i think it's thirteen thousand uh, for those who didn't attend the initial event mastermind is twenty five thousand dollars a year so it's a big chunk, especially when people are used to paying, you know, three, four hundred dollars a month for different types of things in, in mm -hmm. the dietary world. So they're thinking, oh, how am I going to get a return on the investment? And the reality is the relationships you get is the return on the investment. The networking you do is the return on the investment. You will get a return on all of that stuff because you start doing things the you know better. The right you're way. Taking yourself more serious. The right way is dependent on who you are. You know, I always live by the just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. There's a lot of things in podiatry that we can do, but probably shouldn't, you know, or even someone, a certain personality is probably like you and me. I, I get so distracted by bright, shiny objects. If I don't have someone saying, hey, Don, OK, let's just kind of focus in on this thing right now. Like, what's your goal right now for the next six months or whatever? Otherwise, you're always trying these things and you never have any traction. You never get down into one thing. That, and what's the what are the big rocks? What are the big things exactly. that produce? Exactly. So I'm I need that accountability as well. You know, I need to work in that 90 day world, right? Everything I do mind maps for my 90 day world. Every quarter, I've got a different huge mind map that tells me the different wor uh, worlds I'm working in. I work in the one foot, two foot world, the practice. I work in the fabby world of coaching. Um, I've got a separate kind of art thing that I'm building and I've got my personal, you know, family relationships kind of category. So I write down all the things I want to do in all of those categories in the next 90 days. And then I start doing impact filters, you know, like they teach in strategic coach, which is one of my favorite tools I got out of the program because uh, it really articulates what that 90 day project is going to look like and how it's going to be. But to, to finish on the, the other thought of what works best for people, so the next level of, of, of Fabi or the what had been the only level of Fabi really was the mastermind. And I think that's where people really learn best um, if they're willing to open up and share, right? So I also have personal like one-on-one -on -one type of clients uh, that I do with Chris Milky. I say one-on-one, -on -one, it's really two-on-one. Uh, because we bring different things to to the mix. You know, I like numbers and, and vision and dream, and he likes vision, dream, and marketing. Mm -hmm. So you combine all of that together, and, and it's wonderful because um, you get different perspectives of where we've been in practice. And uh, so some people really need that one, a true one-on-one -on -one attention to get them in. So we just had one client who did our one-on-one -on -one for a year, did great, has, has a much better handle on his practice, and now joined Mastermind. Yeah, we lose him as a one on one client, which is fine because he's ready. Some people just aren't ready. Yeah. You, know, you need to you need to get him in there and and then to the mastermind. And once you get into a mastermind and it doesn't have to be, you know, as you know, a podiatry specific mastermind, I think it helps for people struggling in practice yep. uh, or people who just want different ideas within the practice and don't have to want to translate it. Mm -hmm. When I was talking about scheduling institute, that's mostly the dental world. And I spent years dabbling with them and I loved it. I, I love listening to Jay Geyer, his podcasts and everything else. He's got just wonderful value bombs everywhere. Um, but you have to translate it into podiatry. Strategic yep. coach, same thing. Reapply. Yeah, where if you think about strategic coach, they're not really giving you anything specific about your business at all. Nothing. It is all about you and how you approach the business. And once you tweak yourself, you know, you can tweak the staff. And once you tweak the staff, they can tweak the patients and then everything flows. You know, Matt, you said something, I don't know if people caught the indirect nature of it, but most of what we're talking about here is mindset. And I know that sounds hokey. I know it sounds like, what do you, what, we're, we're surgeons, we're podiatrists, you know, why do I need to work? But I remember Jim Rohn, he wrote something. He said, you know, you have to work harder on yourself than anything else. In that personal development, whether it be your brain, your mindset, whether it be, you know, organizing your time, whether it be, you know, anything, but a lot of it is, that's what Dan Sullivan talks about, is a lot about confidence. And so that's a really, really important. You can't be better than you think you are. Yeah. And you have to know who you are, right? Your unique ability. What is the unique ability that you're, you're going for? 
um, that is innately you. You know, you might look at yourself. Someone else might have to define essentially what your unique ability is because you can't necessarily see it within yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've had people like because I don't necessarily look at myself as different from anybody, but they always say, "Oh, you think differently." I'm like, "Okay, I don't know what that means because I just think the way I do. I see the world in color, I like vivid color, and yeah. other people don't." You know, I, I, I like to be creative and other people don't have a creative bone in their body. And to me, I don't understand it because it just, it just comes there. It's right? easy. It's it just, easy. it just comes. It's easy, which makes it lucrative and fun. Right. I mean, that's what we're looking for is yeah. in life, as Joe Polish says, the elf business where it's easy, lucrative and fun. So you find the things that are easy. You do more of it because you enjoy it. And when you enjoy it, it becomes lucrative. It becomes. Correct. Yeah. And, and that's the same thing in, in practice. And, and so as you were mentioning, you know, why would you do a practice that you hate, like seeing patients that you, you just don't like seeing? You have to do what you enjoy and what you're really good at. And usually that'll end up being profitable, you know, for yeah. practices. But unfortunately, some people have mouths to feed, right? As they say, where, you know, you have to see all comers because there's competition out there. Um, I always believe that creativity trumps uh, and cooperation trumps cooperation or I'm sorry, Trump's competition. Hmm. Uh, the more we cooperate, the more creative we get together, uh, which is why, you know, I, I did what I did as far as uh, merging uh, the practice with a bigger organization uh, is because together we can cooperate, we can be creative and we can essentially crush or at least ignore the competition. Yeah. I like to ignore it. I like to, I, I hear about it and people tell me what's going on out there, but as long as I do my own thing, and, and, you know, zig when others zag, then you always win. You know, one thing, as we're talking about this, what about Matt, for the, for the person that's in a, like what we have around here is we have something called fa Fallon or Reliance. There are these big medical groups now where they're hiring podiatrists, multi-specialty. They're probably making some pretty okay money. They're kind of capped in what their production is. I think they earn maybe 30% or something like that. Um, would, would coaching help for that? Or is it more for people that are in, in private, you know, I'm going to just kind of make that distinction. If you're working for a large multi-specialty group or in private practice, um, does it work for both? Interestingly, it, it does. Uh, we've had people in our organization uh, or within Fabi that we've coached that are in a multi-specialty group and they've learned like how to give up the nail care or how to do it better so they can get on the other things that the, the organization wants them to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, learning new techniques, um, teaching other techniques. Um, I mean, it's been wonderful to work within that. A lot of our clients are private practice. Um, some of them started out as private practice and then we get the value up to the point where they sell to a multi-specialty group mm -hmm. uh, or they sell to a bigger organization. And that's fine too. We've had one that was uh, one uh, gentleman who's a really close friend of mine um, who was kind of at the end of his career looking to figure out, you know, what's, what's the exit really. And now he's back loving practice and he's crushing it and he's got a new associate and he's got an exit plan that he didn't have before. So they range from, from anywhere. Anybody can value, get value from it if you want it. Yeah. And I, I think Matt, what you said is, I, I think the problem is we, I, I'm talking me, I'm not talking we, I'm me. When I, when I look at, when I first started coach, I was, I was looking like, you know, it's eight, 10,000 a year or something like that. And then it keeps going up every year. And I'm like, what a great pan. I wish I could just increase my prices every year. They just add, add on 5,000 or a thousand until you get to that level where they want you to be. I'm like, that's great. But I, I think when, when you're not there, you think, well, what's the benefit to it? You know, what's the, like, is it worth that much money? And it really, I think what you said is it's the relationships and those that you meet. And even one simple idea that you could give someone could, you know, what, what do they talk about within strategic coach is the ideas you get are going to bank the next 30 years of coach, you know, cause you've earned so much. It's like, it's, it's, it's a drop in the bucket. That's what you hope to do with when someone joins your group, they're going to get so much more out of it. If they're not, then I'm sure there's some refund policy or just try it for a month. If you don't like it, you don't have to stay. Right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We have money back guarantees yeah. for it, you know, and if it's not for, and it might not be for everybody. It, it isn't for everyone. It, and that's the key is finding the people it isn't for and yeah. doing it. Yeah. So I, want to, I want to pick your brain last moment here. Everything today is subscription. If you've heard me ranting on my podcast, mm -hmm. I think that's the future. And, and my idea was that orthotic subscription or some other type of subscription. Do you have, have you thought about a subscription model within podiatry or can I pick your brain? 
the the only subscription really that I've thought of within as as far as patient care mm -hmm. goes is are things like pedicures, okay. um, you know, or you know, I wouldn't even say like custom orthotics, just because it becomes more difficult to manage that. Mm -hmm. But a subscription arch support type service where. You know, you're doing a prefab, whether it's a power step type device, obviously you'd probably want to private label it um, or do something with it where they last six months to a year. And, you know, they don't have to worry about going back and, you know, finding new or thinking that they might need it. You know, just like you got my razors in the mail, you know, I'm yep. not going to know I'm nice. out, so I'm very out, but, you know, getting arch supports kind of sent to me every six months or once a year mm -hmm. for, you know, the different types. A non-custom one, because the custom ones last longer than three or five years. I was trying to figure it into that and it just didn't work. Exactly. Opinion. The custom orthotic, it, it varies. Plus their shoe styles are going to change. There's a lot of different options yeah. out there. So doing more of a prefab model subscription could get people involved and say, hey, here are your new inserts. If you're having any new problems, come back and see me, right? So it's 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 more or less a prolonged plantar fasciitis campaign for those who never got customs. Because there's a good portion of patients that don't go custom. Yep. At least in Virginia, there's only like a handful of insurances, if that, that cover custom orthotics. So it's an expense. And though the value is there and patients we can get to do it are happy with the results, a good majority of them are not going to do it, nor do they necessarily need it. If you use a really good prefab device, we use forms uh, predominantly and have for years. Uh, they started out as arch molds and eventually sold to PowerStep, and then they created their own company back called Forms. And uh, you know, price point is good. Patients don't balk at it. We charge them what they would on the internet. They can't find it any cheaper. Um, so the idea of just kind of sending it to them, you have credit card on file, and they just I like that. Go so. You you know, I was thinking about for you, you have a, a pedicure salon and a shoe store. One thing I really appreciated, I was listening to uh, Dan Kennedy. He was talking about something. And uh, what do they do is they do a membership. So like an idea is like you would buy a membership to your salon, let's say $25 a month. And you would send them you know, your, your, like whatever it is, coupons for $50 or invite a friend or other things like that beyond that amount and have like a special VIP line to get them in quicker or you know, but if you could get like, like, I don't know, what a uh, five out of 10, you could just, Hey, we have this new subscription model here. It's 25 a month. That means you're going to get one pedicure, invite a friend, get free one on your birthday, things like that. They just keep trucking in there. And then you'll get shoe coupons and other types of things like that. Like that whole cross pollination, I think is a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, with the pedicure world, um, people love their pedicures. So you don't necessarily need it as much other than like buy 11, get one free kind of thing is always good. Okay. But they're going to get it done regardless. But are they going to get it done with you or somebody else? And we're the only like, you know, medical grade pedicure mm -hmm. in the area. So they're welcome to go elsewhere. They won't get a better service. And they might check it out. And they'll, they'll come back because they realize, oh, yeah, that, that was much better. Um, so, you know, there, there's ways you need it. I, I understand it. And we've talked about it in Fabi too, as far as VIP programs for patients, you know, having availability in your schedule to, to get them right in when they need to be, you know, who are your most valuable patients um, and, and give them special treatment and have a, a patient days um, and, you know, a lunch or a barbecue for your most valued patients, uh, your top referral sources, things like that. Um, so it definitely kind of folds into that idea of care to share, um, subscription-y kind of, you know, it's yeah. all marketing. It's really, it's really, I mean, what it, what it boils down to is marketing and how you want to, how you want to market yourself, how you want to market your business. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pick your brain about two other things. Uh, one is what your, I'll tell you what my favorite thing is right now within the practice that's bringing me the most revenue and it's the most enjoyable is my shockwave by far focused in radio, it's, it, it's what brings in all the money right now, right? You know, I would do it all day long. And that's one thing I don't ask you about newsletters, but what's, what's your one thing right now that if someone took away, you'd just cry. Uh, God, I love ingrown toenails. I don't okay. know. Why. I don't know why. Well, I, I kind of do. I mean, it, it's, it's the quintessential podiatry procedure, right? Insurance. I love them too. We cover it. Patient satisfaction is super high. It is, easy to do uh, the vast majority, 99% are the straightforward. Yep. It's got a template in my EMR, so it doesn't take that long to do the note and it pays. 
I mean, and you, and it's like the line in the thorn concept where you take out that little bit and they are just thrilled and they'll send more people. Right. So I, I love like pronouns. I like shockwaves too. You know, shockwave is fun because you get to, you know, really treat people without surgery mm -hmm. um, and get them better. And they love the technology. Uh, they don't necessarily like the process yeah, the pain that goes it. with it and and people and it's always a running joke you know why are you smiling while you're doing this and it's because you know there are other patients you wish you could do this too and just don't qualify yeah uh, but uh yeah so ingrown nails would be the now do you do now i've been doing it took me a little bit of a learning curve two things i love with ingrowns one is the the ani fix and the other one is the carry flex for the ugly ones do you do any of that stuff or your thoughts have you tried it so we do a version of carry flex in the spa Mm -hmm. cosmetic nail restoration um and we let them because they can generate more profitability per, Certainly. per and it, it takes form. time man it, for the for the buck 25 i get from that it it some sometimes it takes me 20 30 minutes i'm thinking oh my goodness exactly and if i have a a trained nail technician who's also a certified medical assistant mm -hmm. who is basically doing it they're generating the 125 while i'm seeing another patient um, so their profitability, you know, and they get they get a percentage on what they do. So their commissions are higher for mm. the types of procedures. It's more rewarding for them to actually do something other than just your standard pedicure. So we've taken it out of the practice. Now, Onifix was a different animal. And I know you you've been dabbling with it. And I, as soon as it came out, I was on the, the webinars learning about it. I have the stuff for it. I did it once or twice. And, you know, I didn't necessarily think so. So, OK, so it was introduced in Canada, right? This is, this is my biggest kind of pet peeve about the whole thing. And I think it works for the right people. Yep. And the problem is in Canada, the they people can't do procedures. It, yeah, they can't do procedures, right? So so when the person who is instructing it is like a, a foot care nurse kind of yep. person who's saying, yeah, the, the surgeon will not do a matricectomy unless we've tried on a fix first. To which leads to the question, well, do your surgeons do matricectomies on like, can they podiatrists do that? And the answer is no, they go to the general surgeon who does those procedures. Yeah, yeah. So there's definitely a, a disc. That's what you have to look at. There's a book called Outliers, right? Where, where it talks about how people's have certain uh, uh, advantages, whether it's their, their name or their, their month of birth, um, or if they had access to a computer at a certain age, that gives them advantages later in life that they may or may not appreciate and, and grow on. So you have to dig deeper uh, to all of these things. With anything in, in, in our world, we have to dig a little deeper. Well, why are they not, why is this a first line treatment? You know, if I can get it done with 90% or 95% success with a single procedure that actually is going to generate more in revenue anyway, why would I not do that? unless the patient has severe peripheral arterial disease or just does not, you know, can't tolerate a local anesthetic uh, or an injection. Yeah. Just those are the people that, that I think Onifix is, is yep. really good for, but selling it as a panacea for ingrown toenails and having to go in, it's just not. It's not. I, I'm a year out. I've done three or four on certain patients and finally I'm seeing the year results. And it's, it's working. And usually it's the patients that I didn't realize how, how patients don't like injections. That's one. But the other ones are the ones that have like the, the ones that if you're going to do the matrix, you're going to have a diving board. Yeah. You know, you're going to have that little, and, and I'm like, you're going to have it. I can do it, but it's going to, it's still dug in so much like that. And it's a little flatter on the base. Those are the ones I do them for. Yeah. The ones that are going to look like a diving board basically in, in people are, are, are liking them. So what it took me, what, one thing though, I know nail techs here, that are actually doing Onifix. So one other thought is get it out of your practice, get it into well, the, them how to do it. It's not, you know, it's not complex. You see, well, that's, that's where the struggle lied. Cause that's where I was trying to figure out where to actually put it in, in our business, because we have the advantage of having the spa. So do we let the spa do it or do it? Because as they bill it and as they're promoting it as this service that you should see your podiatrist for, there's a conflict. Right? I don't want to devalue what other podiatrists are yeah. doing by putting it in my spa. I don't think that would I be fair to podiatry. You know, we get on a whole other tangent of, of like nurse practitioners and foot care nurses and my, you know, my theory on all of that, which I know is big on PM News right now and they're going through it. And, and I think it's taking away from our profession. I'm all about sharing, but, you know, our profession is one that can be wiped off the planet. You know, if these other groups just decided to to merge together, if the you know you got your foot care nurses, 
who are going to refer to ortho for surgery or physical therapy for those needs back to vascular um, and rheumatology. I mean, what is podiatry then? We've given up orthotics and stuff to podorthics and physical therapy. At least some would think we have. We give uh, up di diabetic shoes. Diabetic shoes a lot have done that. You know, I like to hold on. I think podiatry is a wonderful profession where we know the best of the foot and ankle from, you know, every bit about it. And yeah. we just let things go because we're becoming thump on the chest surgeons and we don't have time to do the old school podiatry that I, you know, was kind of sold we to as the dream. You know, I mean, that was like the, the dream was hanging a shingle doing you know, surgery and pads and ingrown nails, dermatology, pediatrics, geriatrics, and doing the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. But now we've got these, you know, essentially orthopedic podiatrists, you know, who don't necessarily want to do this stuff. So they'll get a PA or a nurse practitioner where they could have hired another podiatrist. Yes, it'll cost them more to hire another podiatrist than because nurse practitioners and PAs are cheaper. That's why I think they do it. Um, but a podiatrist will keep it within the profession and they do have a better understanding for the most yeah. part of, of everything that we do. So I would much prefer practices rather than look at that direction, you know, hire another medical assistant, train the medical assistant. Once you yeah. are too busy and your medical assistants are slammed and you can't see any more patients, then you bring on an associate. That's good. That's good. Uh, last point before we finish up, you, this is great content. And I think people are going to really value this newsletter. Um, I do a video newsletter. You've heard me talk about that. What do you do for newsletters? And what I really want to develop is I have 400 doctors that refer patients, for example, in my EMR. I want to send out a monthly newsletter to them. Have you done that? Or do you know anyone that's done that? Yes. Uh, I know a lot of people that have done it. Um, we, Does it we, work? What's the, uh, you know? We, we dabbled in it before it was printed newsletters. You have to do printed newsletters. Now it's like e-newsletters and then it goes back and forth. Um, Chris Milkey, uh, one of my partners in crime mm -hmm. uh, through uh, Podiatry Success Today and through Fabi, um, has created the what he calls, I think, the ultimate podiatric marketing machine. Yep. And every month you get content. He does it. I don't know how. Some people are like, you know, we all have our unique abilities. One of his unique abilities is the content. Is content. I mean, it is just kind of like you. I think you have that ability to put content out there. I wish I had that. I can create yeah. art. But you have your own. Yeah, I've, I've got my own, and but I, I want that because I want to. Uh, there's more in the world that I want out. It's who, not how. You you buy it. That's absolutely, what we do. absolutely. So so I buy it. Yes, and and then I have a marketing person that I, I forward that information to, and then she with her team basically puts it out as a monthly newsletter. Um, to your patients, how about to referring doctors? Uh, to referring docs, yes, there within the marketing machine, there is a, uh, a doctor's news, basically okay. kind of postcard kind of thing that just gives them content. Uh, cool. Well, so yeah, I mean, it, it includes everybody. So one last point with regards to who is your consumer, right? So I think it's important to give back in podiatry, right? Not necessarily, not always to your patients, not always to your staff, but to the profession itself, right? So we have opportunities to volunteer within organizations. So I learned early on volunteering, like with the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons, right? That was my, because my, my residency director, Dan Hatch, was very active with ACFAS at the time, and he got me involved with that. So I got to, to volunteer and participate on the research committee and the evidence-based medicine committees, um, and eventually I moved over to the Consumer Education Committee. And that was, that was the group that was responsible for creating, you know, those handouts. Those are the, great. The facts, right? All of that stuff, right? So I, I always be able to go because I still use them in the practice. And I say, I sit in the committee that writes this. So everything I said will be in here, right? Because I talk fast and practice when I get through, but I know I'm giving them a handout that has all the information. And it was a wonderful committee. I sat on it for a few years um, and then ultimately moved to a different committee, which I didn't necessarily care for because it was all about fighting against other organizations um, and more the political side of things. And I try to stay away from politics best I can. So the Consumer Education Committee, though, the problem I had there was I said, doctors are consumers too. We need to be able to promote to the doctors. And they, and that's at the point where they sent me, well, that really isn't our mission. Our mission is the consumer, you know, the patient, potential patient. So, you know, who probably does that is the professional relations committee or something. And that's where I went next. And that was more politics. And that's when I kind of gave up on it. Now I'm back in it. Now I, I'm back on the consumer education committee. And now they are 
moving more towards physician education, you know, 10 years later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I just think of like in terms of the largest check, we talk about that in strategic coach. Like right now, frankly, it's Google. I would I used to say it was my primary cares, but even if my primary care sends them over, they're gonna check me on Google. And if I'm not if I don't have 500 more reviews than anyone else, they're not gonna, you know, they're gonna look for the guy yeah. that has more reviews. But I still think dripping to them, I think that's for the paid print newsletter, I think it's worth it much more to send it to doctors than it is to patients. And so that's my only, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'll eventually find it or I'll, or I'll get Chris's. So. Well, I would, I would, I would take it one step further and write it for their staff. Cause and, they don't read it. Right. Yeah. Cause the doctors a may not read it B they're oftentimes not the ones making the referrals in those. You're right. Yep. So it's somebody else that, that is doing it. So um, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's honestly, I, I see that all the time. I see, you know, I wish there was a site where we could review patients, right? It's completely unfair that they can review us on anything. Most of any negative review. And surgery right you need there is nothing that's going to work for you short of surgery what else have you got we can try orthotics if you want fine we'll try orthotics having to be covered in his case except for like a hundred bucks right so he paid a hundred bucks for custom orthotics um they worked okay but not where he wanted to be so then he was what else you got i said you need surgery you've got a really bad arthritic joint this needs to be fused now what else we got a laser okay so does laser guess what does it work for him? So he leaves a bad review that basically says, I spent money on this, I spent money on that, it didn't work. I'm like, how do I respond? I can't really respond saying, we told you it wouldn't. Um, yeah, you needed yeah. surgery because you can't divulge any kind of HIPAA you know, related type of stuff. So um, we do rely on, on Google and on Facebook and on health grades Yep. And Yelp, unfortunately, who will bury positive reviews until you pay them. Um, you know, I mean, and that's unfortunate. So yeah. I find that, yes, you have to be present on there. You have to be able to ask your patients for refer or for reviews and have a way of doing that. We're still trying to tackle that. Best uh, I, and I would go one step further. If, if these aren't automated, they're not done. So yeah. I use this thing called patient education genius. And everything I send by, I send the foot health facts from ACFAST to them. And it says, it has a, a, a little a little bot that pops up. Hey, how did we do? Give us an online review. That's how we get so many. Every, it's an automated system. And yeah. if it's not automated, it's, it's not done. Like all these things, these monthly newsletters, these automated requests for everything needs to be automated. You, you're a system guy. And that, that's the way it's done. Otherwise, I'm not going to remember. I'm too busy. Yeah. Yeah. And if, and if you can't automate it, you got to delegate it. Right. So you, someone else has to be doing it yeah. and held accountable for it. Well, great, Matt. You know, we, we've taken a lot of your time. Appreciate you've been so generous for everyone. I think everyone should listen to this a couple of times. If they want to learn more about you or Fabby or things like that, where would they go? Uh, there's a website, fabbyhub.com. Mm -hmm. um, F-A-B-I-H-U-B.com. I'm sure you'll put it in the links. Uh, oh. But there's a little comment. They don't, they don't sell mastermind or Academy on the site. Uh, on the bottom of the page, though, there's like a comments, leave your name, information, questions kind of thing. So that's probably the easiest way. There's also uh, an email that we use within Fabby called support at footandanklebiz.com. And I'll give you that link as well. Um, if people are more curious about, you know, Fabby, um, mm -hmm. and want to learn more about the new Academy program or the Mastermind program, which I believe is now closed for the year. Uh, but Academy is still open for the next couple of weeks. Cool. Well, thank you. Thanks for your time. No, thank you, Don. Appreciate it.